All right, folks, welcome to the blood chapter. So chapter 19 is blood, chapter 20 is the heart, and chapter 21 is the vasculature, the blood vessels. So these three chapters are all the cardiovascular system. So welcome to the blood chapter. So first of all, blood is composed of two components, and that is the liquid component called plasma and the cellular component, which we say are formed elements. Now, why don't we just say cellular component? Probably the reason is because these platelets that you see right here are not full cells. They are cell fragments. So it probably all has to do with the platelets or thrombocytes being cell fragments. In addition, there's probably a historical reason why we say formed elements. And uh, other than that, I'm not really sure why we just don't say cellular component. So we got our plasma and we got our formed elements. You can see that the plasma is about 98 to 99, it's about 99% of our blood. And, uh, uh, well, you can see that here, right here. And in there, you can see that water is the biggest, uh, by the way, let me take that back. If you spin a tube of blood down, half of it cells and half of it's plasma. So I shouldn't say plasma is 99% of your blood, it's not. If you spin a tube of blood down, you're going to have about half cells, and just, just under half, by the way, and about half plasma. Matter of fact, how, many, how much cells are there is called your hematocrit. So this will be just under half. It'll be something like, depending on if you're a man or woman, uh, women run a little lower than men. It'll be in the 40 percentage, 40 percent or so. Men can be up to 52 percent. Men can be slightly over half. So about half and half. Half plasma, half cells. All right, within the plasma, you can see that water is 92% of your plasma. It's a big portion of it. Then we have these other solutes like electrolytes. We're going to talk about a lot of the electrolytes, which are chart, which are ions, cations and anions. And then we have plasma proteins. The biggest plasma protein I need you to know is albumin. Albumin's the major protein in your plasma. And down here we have the formed elements. The majority of your formed elements is red blood cells, erythrocytes. I'll spell that word for you, erythrocyte. And we also have white blood cells and platelets. Platelets are known as thrombocytes. And white blood cells are known as leukocytes. And yeah, you need to know these alternate words. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll use the words thrombocytes, leukocytes, and erythrocytes rather than reds, whites, and platelets. So you can see you can see that the difference there. Uh, please become very familiar familiar with those relative concentrations. This is another slide showing you the the components of plasma and other solutes. So albumin is the big one. Albumin is the major protein in your plasma. Without it, you have diseases like quashier quashier core and marasmus. We will be talking about these, but I might as well. I'll put these on here for you right now. If you have low albumin, you get quashier core. You could get marasmus. I'm not so sure I'm spelling marasmus correctly. Uh, we'll talk about these in some detail, but what they have to do with it is albumin keeps the fluid in your blood. It, it exerts an osmotic pressure on in your blood, so you get what we call osmotic recall of water, and we'll talk some more details about that. If you lack albumin, you lose water out of your blood and you get quashier core or marasmus. The globulins we're going to talk about are the immunoglobulins, right here, this word right here, or antibodies. So immunoglobulins or antibodies. Pretty important, but uh, definitely not a major component of your proteins, and that fluctuates, by the way, depending on if you have an infection or don't have an infection. Another very important protein is fibrinogen. This is involved in blood clotting. Uh, you have about 200 milligrams per deciliter of fibrinogen in your blood at any given time, but you can see it's only about 4% of, of the proteins in your plasma. All right, the other solutes here are things like, uh, you know, your LDL and HDL, your, your cholesterols, your electrolytes right here. Very important, by the way. Electrolytes are extremely important. You have waste products that your kidneys are eventually going to going to filter out so these are the other things that are in your in your uh, plasma all right these are the cells these are the formed elements platelets are not 
full cells. They don't have a nucleus, but neither do reds. So what's the difference? Well, platelets are actually fragments of a megakaryocyte. So we have this big cell in our bone marrow called a megakaryocyte. And pieces pinch off. And when pieces pinch off, they become these platelets. And these platelets float around our bloodstream. Their primary function is to clot. You get a platelet plug when you cut your blood vessel. And when you're shaving and you cut yourself and it's not stopping, the bleeding's not stopping fast enough for your life, you have to get going and go to work, you rip off a little piece of toilet paper and you put it on the cut, you're actually doing the job of the platelets. You're, the toilet paper is now plugging up the, the hole. Now the platelets will plug up that hole, even though you have your toilet paper on there. And if you pull the toilet paper off too soon, you pull the platelets off with it and you start bleeding again. However, if you wait long enough to pull the toilet paper off, then you don't pull the platelets with it because they've been stabilized. And we'll talk about that stabilization process. So platelets are cell fragments. They're not full cells. And they do blood clotting. Your leukocytes here, you have three granulocytes, which means they have prominent granules in the cytoplasm. Those are your neutrophils, your eosinophils, and your basophils. These are your three granulocytes. And you have two A granulocytes. And the prefix A means without granules, so A granulocytes. And your two A granulocytes are lymphocytes and monocytes. Each of these leukocytes has a different job to keep you healthy. So they all fight off infection in some fashion. And, they, and some of them actually attack cancer cells if you were to come down with cancer. So they all help, help to keep you health, healthy, but they all have a slightly different job, and we'll talk about the jobs. In some cases, uh, we're not going to talk about these in detail until Chapter 22. In fact, I won't talk about lymphocytes a lot until we get to Chapter 22, which is the immune chapter. But we'll talk about as an overview of some of these cells today. And then here's your red blood cells. This is the majority of your, of your formed elements right here, and they carry oxygen. That's the primary role of red blood cells is to carry oxygen. So they pick up oxygen in your lungs and they carry it to all cells of your body. All right, so that's blood in a nutshell right there. This is what it looks like when you spin it down. So you can see a picture right here of the phlebotomist drawing your blood. I think everyone in, every one of us in here has had our blood drawn. Uh, these colored uh, these colored, uh, colored top tubes, like that one happens to be lavender, they mean something. A phlebotomist knows which tube to draw based on which tests are ordered because they have different anticoagulants or maybe they don't have anticoagulants. Some of them don't have anticoagulants. And the different colored of the the different colored top tubes tell us what uh, is going to happen with the blood and what i what do i mean by what's going to happen with the blood well here, here's a question for you if i draw draw a tube of blood out of your arm and here's the tube of blood right here and i sit it in a rack for 20 minutes and it clots so it clots and then i spin it down in the centrifuge what's up here and what's down here? Well, what's down here is cells. But what's up here? You're going to say it's plasma. But it's not plasma. Because we allowed this blood to clot. And because we allowed it to clot, fibrinogen was converted to fibrin. And that became part of the clot. And now down with the cells is the fibrin and the platelets. And it's a because the clot spun to the bottom now. The platelets used to be right here. If you didn't allow the blood to clot. But now it's down in here. Because you allow the platelets to combine with fibrin and clot. And then you spun it down. So what's left up here? It's not plasma anymore because it's lacking fibrinogen. It's serum. So the bottom line is if you allow your tube of blood to clot and then spin it down, you get serum and cells separated. If you don't allow the blood to clot in the tube and you spin it down, you get plasma and cells that are separated. There is a difference between serum and plasma. And the big difference is plasma has fibrinogen and serum does not. That's the big difference. All right, uh, you, in some cases, you're going to have to memorize uh, counts of the cells. And in this case, I do want you to memorize it. 
uh, you have 250 to 400,000 platelets per microliter, you're going to say, it says cubic millimeter right here. A cubic millimeter is a microliter. They are the same thing. A cubic millimeter is a microliter. Your white blood cells here are five to 10,000 per microliter. And then your red blood cells are four to six million per microliter. Look how your red blood cells are a thousand times more than your white blood cells. Your red blood cells are a thousand times more uh, abundant. A thousand times a thousand is a million, by the way. So you have a thousand times more reds than you do whites. So notice that. You have about 25 to 50 times more platelets than you do whites. Not thousands more. So those are absolute counts of your cells, and you need to know those counts. You need to know those normal values. You need to know them for me, and you need to know them in your life, because you're going to be looking at lab values the rest of your life as you work in healthcare, and you're going to see these all the time. You need to be familiar with those uh, absolute values. Now, these are absolute values. These are absolute counts. How many cells per microliter? These are relative values right here. And what I mean by relative values is it's just the percentage of your whites. And it is you should know these percentage of whites approximately. I wouldn't sit here and commit, be say, oh, it has to be 60 to 70%. Just pick one of these numbers for neutrophils and memorize it. Say, pick 60% if you want. Pick 65% if you want. The relative abundance of whites has a mnemonic. Never let monkeys eat bananas. And never is neutrophil... Let is lymphocyte, monkeys is monocyte, E is eosinophil, bananas is basophil. So that's the relative amounts of your white blood cells in your blood. Never let monkeys eat bananas. Neutrophil, lymphocyte, monocyte, eosinophil, basophil. Basophils are so rare that, I, I mean, I've done thousands of peripheral blood smear uh, uh, analyses. You know, I put peripheral slides on a microscope and I look at them. I've done thousands of them because I used to work in the lab. And basophils are so rare that when I count 100 white cells, I, I hardly ever see a basophil. Matter of fact, it's so rare to see a basophil that when I see one, it's pretty cool and I look at it for a little while. You can see that they're half a percent to one percent. That means if you count 100 whites, you're not likely to see a basophil you'd have to count 200 whites to see one basophil. And typically in the lab, we count 100 white blood cells to do our differential. All right. So that's uh, spinning a tube of blood down and separating the cells from the plasma or serum, depending if it's plasma or serum. So this is some general characteristics of blood. It's core body temperature. So you can see here that I mean, you probably learned that body temperature is 37.2 degrees Celsius, or maybe you just learned it was 37 degrees Celsius. Most of us just use 37. And that is true. But that's putting the thermometer under your armpit or maybe putting it in your mouth. But the core of your body is just slightly warmer. And the core body temperature is what blood runs at, and that's 38 degrees Celsius. So that would be the more uh, a more accurate temp. You'd get a temperature of around 38 if you did a rectal temperature or something like that. But our our axillary temperature or our oral temperature is usually about 37.2. Blood is very viscous. Uh, first of all, it has a lot of proteins in it. It has albumin and fibrinogen and globulins. Uh, secondly. Uh, it's filled with a lot of electrolytes, like it has 140 millimoles per liter of sodium, and um, it has about 110 to 120 millimoles per liter of chloride, just so on, on and on and on. It just has a whole bunch of dissolved substances in it, so it has high viscosity. It's really the proteins that give it its high viscosity. It's slightly alkaline. Absolutely remember this, these pH, this pH range. Our body pH is 7.35 to 7.45. Now, here's the, here's the nuance here. Anything less than 7.35 is called acidosis. But it's really not acidic. It's not less than 7. But it's called acidosis because it's less than our normal body pH. 
So anything less than 7.35 is called acidosis. And we'll talk more about pH in a bit. You have about uh, five, to, depending if you're male or female and what your body stature is, how big you are, you have about, um, I, mean, I usually say anywhere between three and seven liters of blood. A real big person would have seven liters of blood. You can see your books telling you that if you're a male, you have five to six liters. And if you're a female, you have four to five liters. But I can tell you that there are some people that are small statured enough to have only three liters of blood. And there are some people large statured enough to have seven liters of blood. So I usually think three to seven liters. Another way to do it is take 0 0.07 and multiply it by how much you weigh in kilograms. If you weigh 220 pounds, that's 100 kilograms. I'm using 100 so it's easy. You would have 7 liters of blood because 100 times 0 0.07 is 7. So this is a big person. This is a 220 pound person. And that's 7 liters of blood they would have. So you can calculate about how much blood a person has. It's 7% of their body weight. And by the way, 7% is 0 0.07. And that body weight has to be in kilograms. It can't be in pounds. So you need to know that for the test, by the way. 7% of your body weight measured in kilograms. That's approximately your blood volume. All right, this picture is not in your book. But this is done in the clinical lab all the time. Matter of fact, we diagnose diseases this way, like multiple sclerosis and things like that. So what we do is we load your blood into a trough right here. And what, actually, I, let me take that back. I mean, it is part of your blood. We load your plasma or your serum into this trough right here. Now, you're going to say to me, which one, plasma or serum? Depends. Depends on the test we're doing. If we want to see the fibrinogen band, we do plasma. If we don't care if the fibrinogen band is there, we do serum. Because the only difference between plasma and serum is fibrinogen. So we load that in here. Then we apply an electrical current to the electrical. Yeah, I said that. We apply an electrical current to this. And we run the proteins down a gel. This is called gel electrophoresis. This is actually called serum protein electrophoresis, abbreviated SPEP. Serum protein electrophoresis. And the proteins separate based on a mass to charge ratio. Let me spell out electrophoresis, unless it already is someplace. It's not, so let me spell out electrophoresis. I need more room. Serum protein, electrophoresis. Electrophoresis always separates, electrophoresis, always, always separates things. That's the purpose of electrophoresis, to separate molecules. And we separate molecules based on a mass to charge ratio. We usually abbreviate mass to charge as M over Z. But you can say mass to charge ratio. Now what that means is the positive charged things will run towards the cathode and the negatively charged things will run towards the anode. Look at the anode. Here's how I remember anode and cathode. Anodes attract anions. Cathodes attract cations. So cathodes attract cations. Cations are positively charged, as you know. And anions or anodes attract anions. Anions are negatively charged, as you know. Having said that, a cathode must then be negatively charged. Here's another way to remember it if you, are, um, if you remember this. Old TVs used to be cathode ray tubes. They used to shoot electrons at a screen, basically. So how could a cathode shoot electrons at a screen if it wasn't negatively charged? It, it couldn't. So cathode ray tubes would, would uh, bombard a, a f some kind of phosphorus screen or something like that with negative charges. The TVs aren't like that anymore, by the way. Unfortunately, we've lost some good things. So cathodes attract cations and anodes attract anions. All right. At physiological pH... Our proteins are negatively charged. Therefore, our proteins travel towards the anode. Positive attracts negative. But as you can see, albumin is one of our smaller proteins, and it travels the furthest. And then we have alpha globulins, which are, smaller, which are bigger than albumin, but the next smallest. Then we have beta globulins, which are bigger than the alpha globulins, but the next the index size. And then we have our real big proteins called gamma globulins. 
And see, the big proteins don't travel as far because they're too big. They weigh too much. The albumin, which is only about 60 kilodaltons, one of the smallest proteins we have, travels the furthest. And we separate these proteins and we put them in bands. We have the albumin band and the alpha globulin band and the beta globulin band and the gamma globulin band. And in the lab, we know which proteins run in these bands. So if you have a particularly large band, you can tell the doc, the doctor, that you have a particularly large alpha globulin band and it might be high transferrin. Transferrin runs in the alpha band, by the way. You don't have to memorize that. If you have a particularly large, large gamma band, you might have high antibodies, high immunoglobulins, because the immunoglobulins are gamma globulins. Matter of fact, we diagnose multiple sclerosis because in our gamma band, we have these, these oligoclonal banding patterns. So this, is all, this would all be gamma. But we see these extra lines in our gel, and they're called oligo, few, oligo means few, oligoclonal bands and that's that's uh, diagnostic of multiple sclerosis so no this picture is not in your book but it's pretty important you understand serum protein electrophoresis because we use it we use it to diagnose everything now having said that I am not going to have you memorize which proteins belong in which band and I'm not going to have you do that although it is pretty cool that's it for this part. I'll see you in the next section.